Okay, welcome everyone to the third Zoom program about my art project in Sacramento, California that's for the Artist in Residency program. And this uh, project is called Living Quilt for Sojourner Truth. And it will be installed on November 21st at Sojourner Truth Community Garden in Sacramento. And um, I'm doing these uh, programs on Zoom so that I can share my process for doing the handmade paper quilt with seeds for wildflowers in the pulp. And so there'll be a series of programs. I'm also recording these and putting them on Zoom later so you can watch them at any time if you can't um, participate in these Wednesday afternoon sessions. Uh, today's program is going to be about coloring the pulp and also about the seeds for wildflowers that are used um, to make the, the living quilt. And so I'm going to start um, with a demonstration of how to color the pulp. Okay, over here you can see my materials set out. One of the important things um, in coloring pulp is to use some sort of retention agent. It's sort of a magical thing that makes the color go into the pulp and stay. It becomes, uh, you know, permanent, it doesn't wash out or rinse out. And um, I'm using this, um, it's a Jack Ward. Um, company um, and it's called Permanent Die Set Concentrate. And you can get all these uh, materials for dyeing uh, paper pulp as well as for dyeing cloth um, at a place in the Bay Area that's called Dharma Trading Company. That's D-H-A-R-M-A. And they're in San Rafael and they have a website. You can order whatever you need there. So you can get this Jack Ward permanent dye set concentrate there. And I use dye. Many paper makers color their pulp with pigment, but I like using dye because it's um, not as bad for the environment, hopefully. And I've Check, this is a non-toxic dye. It's a water-based product and it's a liquid dye. It's um, a vinyl sulfon dye. I used to use um, a liquid fiber reactive dye that I could get from Createx, but it's no longer made. I still have some of it. It also works well, but um, you can also use Procyon powder dyes. You just have to wear a mask or something to protect your lungs when you're using it because it's in a powder form. Okay, to do the dyeing of the pulp, you um, first put some water in a small container. This is just clear water. And then I'm gonna put um, some of the the, the permanent die set concentrate. I'm going to use two tablespoons of this. Well, actually, I'm going to use four because I'm going to be dying two buckets of pulp. So that's four. And usually, um, you can see here, this is a bucket of the white pulp. Um, it's abaca, and it's the unbleached abaca, and I just mixed it in the blender. You saw that in the last program, I believe, how to mix and make the pulp. So I have two buckets of the white pulp here, and I'm going to color one of them yellow and one of them red, because in this quilt that I'm making is the North Star pattern, and it has red, blue, yellow, and white. Um, colors in it. So first I'm going to put this retention agent that I've mixed in a little bit of water. I'm going to put about half of it in this bucket and the rest in this bucket. And then I have two big spoons 
that I'm going to stir that um, retention agent into each of these uh, uh, buckets of coal. I stir much better with my right hand. <laughs> And you just need to stir that a few minutes to make sure it's distributed um, well throughout the bucket of pulp. And you always color the pulp when it's wet and it's in the um, water, enough water to make it, you know, easy to mix. Um, this is thicker than you would normally use in the vat for making paper. In fact, it just comes straight out of the blender and poured into the bucket. Um, so, you know, when you make paper with it, you usually add more water. So you put the retention agent in first. I found that works best. And, you know, then um, that will make the color go into the fiber. All right. Now I'm going to put on my rubber gloves. It's best to always use rubber gloves when you're doing any kind of dyeing. You don't want to color your fingers. <laughs> so I have these really long, heavy duty um, rubber gloves. Okay, now I'm going to put a little bit of water in each of these containers. And one, I'm going to put the yellow color in. And one I'm going to put the red color in. And this um, dye is also very concentrated. Um, you just usually use one teaspoon of it. And you know, you can use more or less depending on you know what color you want to get. And this red, as you can see, is very dark. And it's kind of a pinky red. Um, to get a true red, I found that I had to add a little bit of this um, other red that's um, a little bit different. So I'm going to add just a tiny bit of it. You know, you can sort of play with your colors to see what color you like. Okay, I need to rinse this out. Yellow. And I'll put the yellow in this cup of water. You always add it to a little bit of water so it'll um, be easier to mix it into the pulp. And actually, I put a little bit of yellow in this red so it would make it a little brighter. We'll put that in here in the bucket that's going to be red. And you just add it while you're stirring. This already had the retention agent mixed into it. Keep stirring for a few minutes. If you figure that's not enough color, um, you can add more of the retention agent and you can add more of the color. Looks like it's going to be rather pink. So I will add more. I'll try the yellow here and see what it looks like. Really a bright yellow. 
And to make it more of a gold than yellow, I add just a little bit of the red to it. And here again, you can, you know, stir it in and see what you think about the color. The red just makes it kind of more of a golden yellow. This is really a neon yellow in this bright yellow dye. That's good. And you know, to, to tell what color it might be when it's dry, it's best to get a little bit of it and squeeze all the water out of it. And you know, then you can sort of tell what color it might be when it's dry. It does dry a little bit lighter every time. So that looks like the yellow is gonna be good. Um, I think I'm gonna put a little more of the dye. Um, fixative into the um, red bucket. I don't, you know, when I was doing the pouring in there, I don't think I poured half of it in each bucket. <laughs> you know, when you're doing these demonstrations, you're always thinking about several things at once and it's easy to not do it exactly the way you plan. But you can see that's not taking the color very well. So I'm going to add a little bit more formation aid and then a little bit more of the red color. I believe that was my red. It probably needs more than that. Put a little water in here. This is a really full bucket of pulp. Usually I don't get the buckets quite this full. And I'm going to add a little bit of yellow to the red to make it look a little more of a true red color. There, that's looking better. It would also be good, um, you know, if you're really particular about the color and how to see the color, it would be best to have white buckets or something instead of these black ones where it makes it a little harder to see the, the color of the pole. In my instructions, when I give a workshop, I always say, you know, stir for 15 or 20 minutes um, to make sure the color is distributed throughout the, the bucket of coal. And then I just leave it sit overnight. 
And if you leave it set overnight, it will, you know, absorb all of the color and make the darkest color. So this we can see now is going to be a much more um, red color. Okay, so I'm just going to leave these um, buckets of pulp, colored pulp, sitting now um, overnight. And then what will happen because it has the retention agent or that uh, dye set uh, concentrate in it, the, um, the water starts to turn clear. And you can see it's already happening here. Um, the water is clear and it won't come off on your hands. The color has gone into the pulp. And that's what you want to happen because when you put this in the tub and start making your paper, um, you don't want the, the dye color coming off on your hands. So once you finish that, you know, you can take off the gloves um, because it won't, you know, come on your hands. Now I'm going to just close up everything here, make sure. So again, um, in the Bay Area, you can get these um, products for dyeing cloth and for dyeing paper pulp at uh, Dharma Trading Company, which is in San Rafael. And I order them online and, you know, just by experimenting, I found these things work. Um, there are other suppliers um, that also recommend, you know, things for coloring pulp. And uh, a lot of paper makers use pigment and also a type of retention agent to make the color go into the pulp. All right, now I'm going to um, talk more about the um, seeds and how you use wildflower seeds in your handmade paper pulp to make it into a living, blooming artwork over time. And um, I get the seeds from a company called American Meadows, and you can order those online also, AmericanMeadows.com. And um, I've been working with them for a long time and doing these projects, and, and um, they really like what I'm doing. They are supporting this project by giving half the cost of the seeds as a donation to the project in Sacramento. And so this seed, I, I label them all, you know, with what color they are. You know, I go online and look them up and see what, what the flower looks like and what color it is, read all about it. And um, then, you know, the seeds come in these cloth bags. And um, then I just dump some of the seeds in each of the colors of pulp. And down here where I have the, the bats, this is the blue one, the yellow one, the red one, and the white one. And so I just put a few of the seeds sprinkled into the pulp, and you can see them. Some of the seeds are really tiny. This one is a little bit bigger, so you can see it. And then you just stir it into the pulp. And you can see there's some other seeds in there also that make yellow flowers. And you can um, leave the seeds in the, the tub of water and pulp, um, you know, maybe for two weeks. But eventually these seeds would start sprouting right in the tub because, you know, that's what seeds need for sprouting is water. And they would need some soil, of course, to live, but, you know, it, you don't want to keep it in here too long uh, before you make the paper um, so the seeds won't start sprouting in the tub. And um, 
you know, now I'm going to show you a um, PowerPoint program that will um, give you more information about the different seeds I'm using. Okay. Let me see if I can get one of the videos turned off. So we're going to stop that video. We're going to turn on my video. And I'm going to pin my video. And, you know, can you see me now? I hope so. All right, um, I'm going to talk about the different seeds and um, you know, for each project, I go through and look at a lot of wildflowers uh, to pick the ones that are most suitable for that project. For this project, um, I, you know, know the Sacramento climate and American Meadows also has a map that gives you, you know, the different parts of the country and what uh, type of seeds will work best there. And uh, we're in zone nine. So, um, it's the Pacific Northwest and um, the Southwest. And so I'm going to um, share my screen now so that I can show you this PowerPoint about the different seeds so you can see what the seeds look like. Okay, let's see. Going to view, no, not that one. Slideshow, okay. Play from start. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. Um, these um, will just show you some pictures of the wildflower seeds that I'm using. And some of the considerations when choosing the seeds you know, you first want to make sure they're suited to the climate and the place where you're going to plant them. And also, I'm always concerned about the environment, that the seeds are not going to be invasive or anything that would be harmful to that place. Um, and also, I choose wildflowers um, that will grow in full sun, because usually I'm making this uh, flower bed out in an open area in a park and so you want seeds that grow well in full sun. Uh, for the white flowers, I'm using sweet alyssum, which is the one you see here on the left, and also one called baby's breath. And uh, the other things you need to consider is um, the blooming season. You know, wildflowers will bloom at different times. Some will bloom in the early, early spring and some in the midsummer. And I try to pick a flower that will bloom for a long extended period uh, so that people will get a chance to enjoy it. And then you'd want to know the height of the flower. You know, some wildflowers can be three or four feet tall. And usually I try to pick those that are about 18 inches and all the flowers about the same size. So, um, you know, that, that's another thing to consider. In the white, I'm also using a white poppy. It's just like our regular golden poppy, but, it, but it's a very um, white flower petal and just has the yellow in the center. So it's a nice addition um, to a wildflower project. You can see this one is called the California Poppy Ivory Castle. And you also want to check that your um, flowers, you know, will maybe bloom at the same time. If you're trying to make a pattern in the quilt, um, you know, if they some bloom really late in the summer and some only early in the spring, then you need to have a variety in there. That's why I use two or three uh, of the same color in the, the pulp. 
Okay, these are the yellow wildflowers I'm using. Uh, of course, the California golden poppy is one of our favorites and it grows so well in our area of the country. Um, and then another yellow flower is one called Tidy Tips. And it has the yellow flower, the yellow center, and a little bit of white on the edges of the petals. And it blooms earlier than the poppies usually. And then I also found another very bright yellow flower that's called Suffer Cosmos. And this Cosmos flower is one that's easy to grow, but it usually is very tall. And I found a dwarf one, which is only 18 to 24 inches tall. So I'm hoping it will be fine. When I used a white Cosmos in another installation one time, it kind of took over everything. It became so tall. It was three or four feet tall and, you know, um, kind of crowded out some of the lower um, wildflowers. So I hope this one is going to be a good one for the yellow color also. It blooms later in the summer. And for the red wildflowers, um, I'm using Scarlet Flax and Drummond Phlox. And um, both of these are pure red color. Um, you know, some of the red colored flowers are much um, pinker usually. And these seem to grow well in our area and um, are about 18 to 24 inches tall. And I'm also using a red poppy. The red poppy is one we don't see too much in California, but it's, it's um, all over the world. This is the famous poppy that was uh, in the Flanders Field poem of the red poppy. And I, I like it a lot. It's a very bright, pure red color and about 18 inches tall. And, um, you know, the other th thing about the flowers is that you look and see which ones are annual and which ones are perennial. And those two words are familiar to gardeners. An annual is one that comes up and blooms, makes seed, and then dies away and lasts usually for one year and you have to replant each year. But some of the seeds I use are perennials, um, especially if they're native plants and you know there's something we want to continue in this place. Um, and many of the things like the golden California poppy, it's really considered an annual, but in our area it it does come back every time. Okay, then um, the next ones are the California bluebells, the blue flowers. I use the California bluebell and um, the Texas blue bonnet. Okay. And blue flax and Chinese forget-me-nots. There is a true forget-me-not, but this Chinese one seems to grow much better and bloom better, so I'm using it. Um, okay, I'm gonna, that's, that's it about the seeds and the pictures of them. I'm gonna end the slideshow and stop sharing and go back to my video, let's see, yes. Okay, can you see me now? Hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? Huh. Okay, I'm happy to answer any questions. You can go to the chat and put in a question or you can just unmute yourself and um, ask me a question if anybody has a question. Okay.
Okay, I think the time is about out um, for this session. And uh, I will just end the program and I'll say that next week I will show you how to make one of the squares at least and put all of the, um, the quilt together. And um, I wanted to thank you for joining the program. And these will be put up on YouTube later so you can watch it at your convenience. And, you know, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me or call me um, at any time. And this program is part of my Sacramento Artist in Residency project sponsored by the city of Sacramento. And, um, you know, they also have a website if you want to check out all the other interesting projects that are going on in Sacramento at this time. So thank you everyone. And um, we will end this meeting now unless anybody has any questions or comments. Okay, thank you, Jane. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.